RX Television on RXMuscle.com. This is Ask Dave, better known as Hashtag Ask Dave, brought to you by Species Nutrition. Visit SpeciesNutrition.com. Testalize is back in stock. You've been asking for it for months. We finally got the, the manufacturer to do it the right way to incorporate all the ingredients that they wanted in test lives. It is back right now at SpeciesNutrition.com. This is your 30-minute question and answer show with Dave Palumbo. All your questions on diet, training, supplementation, IV pros. We are in the thick of the post-Olympia show cycle. It is all on the table. As we now bring in Dave Palumbo, Dave, big Rami, the big story, as well as Flex Lewis, big Rami for the, I guess, the 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 good reason of winning the Arnold Classic Europe, whereas Flex Lewis winning the Korea Pro, but embroiled in some major, major controversy, both at the show and on social media. Yeah, I just recorded my radio show with Chris on TV. I know you guys like it on video, so we recorded it on that, so you can guys see the pictures while we're talking about it. And I'm not going to go and rehash everything, but... Yeah, you know, uh, Big Rami obviously winning the Arnold Classic, uh, tremendous win for him. Phil Heath wasn't in the lineup, of course. Uh, William Bonlack in the second position and Sean Roden in third. And then, of course, in Korea, or South Korea, I should say, Flex Lewis holding serve, you know, all bit controversy uh, kind of plagued that show. Hadi Shupin from Iran, a lot of people thought he should have won. Some people thought Jose Raymond should have won. It was was a whole mosh... Scramble basically what happened. I wasn't there. I gave my input on it. Uh, there was some disgusting, you know, and very negative comments uh, put all over Flex Lewis's uh, social media page. Uh, just horrible stuff from death threats and, and other threats against his wife. And, uh, you know, it, it, it really bothered me. And I'm not going to go into it. Watch Heavy Muscle Radio and you'll see my entire rant on it and how I, what I felt about it. But uh, it was. It doesn't pat, cast a very good light on our sport when we see stuff like that. But, once again, a lot of excitement in the world of bodybuilding, that's for sure. Jim Mannion, you know, making the announcement this past week that uh, the NPC now will be the, uh, the, the governing body worldwide in terms of uh, turning people pro. Uh, the IFBB Amateur League will be out of the picture. If you want to become an IFBB pro, you'll have to do it through the, the NPC or an NPC affiliate in other countries. And, and uh, this year, for 2017, that doesn't apply. Uh, any, anyone who qualifies for pro status will be, um, will be uh, I guess you could say, Jim Mannion will acknowledge that and will give you pro status. So if you say you won the Arnold Amateur, uh, even though it's an IFBB amateur sanctioned show, they'll still give you pro status. But next year, 2018, that's when you'll have to do it through an NPC or an NPC affiliated organization. So that's big news that hit our sports. We had a, we had a lot going on this past week, Sid. Dive right into the questions. Go to Mike Pachulski or Pachulski first. Dave, your best fat burning stack of choice pre contest. Um, I've said this many times before. I feel the best, you know, two banger is the is clenbuterol and cytomel, or cytomel also known as T3. Um, th- those two together seem to give you the most bang for your buck. The great thing about them is that you can use them in women too. There's, they're not they're non steroidal, so there's no side effects or masculinizing side effects of them. And I just think they work great. I think, it's the, you know, if I had to pick one drug, people always ask, what's the best fat burning drug uh, available? I would say clenbuterol. Uh, I don't include DNP in any of my stacks or any of my opinions because I think it's not, a, it, it's a poison and I, don't, I would never tell anyone to ever use it. I don't think it's safe. And so I don't, you know, when people ask, well, what about that? What about DNP? I don't even include that. It's not something that should be considered to, uh, using. You, I would never, ever uh, recommend it. It's way too dangerous. Mo Fitness 1130, does BCAA really slow down fat burning process? Here, here's what I meant by, by taking branch chain amino acids that can slow down fat loss. There are people that drink branch chains all day long, okay, when they're dieting. Before they do cardio, they're drinking branch chains so they don't lose muscle in their mind. Uh, while they're doing cardio, they're drinking branch chains. While they're weight training, they're breaking, they're breaking branch chains. Now, if you're always infusing your body with, with amino acids, your body can convert these amino acids very easily into glucose, and that's what it will do. When you have excessive amounts of amino acids, especially the branch chains, your body will convert them to glucose via gluconeogenesis in the liver, and your body will use the glucose for fuel. Now, if you're going and doing cardio and trying to burn stored body fat, if your body has a fuel source available, it's not going to do that. So 
I can't tell you how many people have come to me, hey, three weeks out, four weeks out, six weeks out from a show, and said, Dave, I don't know what's wrong. I can't lose weight. I can't get in shape. And, I, and they sign up with me, and I, and I go through their whole, their whole litany of what they're doing, and I see they're taking branch chains six times a day. I cut it out, and all of a sudden, they start losing weight again. It's, 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 it happens all the time. Uh, another thing that happens all the time is I, I have people give me food diaries of what they're consuming. And I find that they're using drinks that have sugar in them. They're using condiments uh, that they think are, are, are carb-free because a sprinkle of it is carb-free. But meanwhile, in the ingredient list, there's carbs in there. Guys, read your ingredient lists. It's so simple to know what you can and can't use. If there's sugar in something or carbs in something, okay? You shouldn't be adding that to your foods, even if you do eat carbs. Let's say you eat a half a cup or a cup of brown rice at every meal. You shouldn't be eating condiments that have sugar in them or drinking drinks that have sugar in them. So you got to be smarter than that. you got to read your labels. TD Ross 44, if mTOR is a chemical process for protein synthesis to occur in the body and it requires insulin present and bound to the receptor for translocation of leucine shuttles to trigger protein synthesis, and transcription of new proteins from the skeletal muscle cell nucleus. How can one grow so much muscle on a ketogenic diet since only carbohydrates can release insulin for that response? Okay, that, that sounds really, very, really good. And probably a lot of guys out there are watching this and saying, oh my God, what is Dave gonna say to this? Does anyone even know what that even means? Okay, he looks like he, he copied and pasted it out of something. First of all, insulin is not necessary to turn on mTOR. You want to talk to one of the most foremost authorities in protein metabolism and protein science in the world, Dr. Scott Connolly. He'll tell you the only thing that's necessary to turn mTOR on, and, and here's, here's a very easy schematic way of understanding what mTOR is, because it sounds very sophisticated. mTOR is a switch. Imagine a light switch on the wall. And when the, sw when, when the switch goes on, the protein uh, machinery, the protein synthesis machinery gets turned on, like a factory that gets turned on. And when mTOR is not on, Okay, there's no protein synthesis uh, going on. When you finish a workout, okay, and you infuse your body with protein, just protein, let's, let's do a 30 gram dose of whey protein. M that's, that obviously, uh, whey protein is very high in branched chain amino acids, and when that stuff hits your bloodstream and gets into your cells, it flips the switch to mTOR on. It turns on the protein machinery, okay? And now assuming you eat enough protein with that, the body will start repairing muscle cells. The only thing that, that turns on mTOR is, is protein, specifically the branched chain amino acids, okay? So it doesn't matter if you eat carbs, if your body releases insulin or not. Insulin is not a dependent step to turn on mTOR. And the truth is that once mTOR is turned on, if you don't continue to give your body the raw materials it needs to build muscle, nothing will happen. So just turning on mTOR alone is, is not sufficient. If, you're, if you turn the factory on to make cars, but you don't have any metal there to actually make the actual car out of it, it doesn't matter if the factory is open and the machinery is the machinery is running. You can't build a car, so you need to number one turn the EM tour on, and then you need to infuse the body with what are the essential nutrients: protein and fat. Protein being the internal components of the muscle cell, the essential, the outer components, the cell membrane, are your essential fatty acids. Old school, Matt. Is taking Adderall or having high levels of caffeine, uh, will that affect any muscle building processes? Um, it, sh it won't affect the, the building of muscle. What it can do is it can increase the stress levels in the body. A lot of, you know, any kind of time you take a lot of stimulants, it stresses the body out. When the body's stressed, it releases cortisol, okay? Cortisol is a, is a stress hormone released from the adrenal glands um, that has as a side effect, uh, a muscle degrading effect or a catabolic effect in the body. So we don't want a lot of cortisol present. So you don't want it, that doesn't mean drinking a cup of coffee is gonna cause your body to crank out tons of cortisol. But if you're constantly taking stimulants all day long, whether they be in pill form, pre-workout form, uh, coffee form, you're gonna stress your body out and it's gonna be on edge. They call, you know, think of the caffeine jitters. That jitteriness is gonna definitely gonna cause a lot of a cortisol output. Uh, and when cortisol is cranked out in your body, you have a very good chance of breaking down muscle rather than building muscle. Let's go to the one underscore 100. Dave, when increasing my squat load, I feel my shins firing and traveling forward. Also, my heels tend to want to rise. I feel like I'm doing it wrong. Yeah, you know, uh, one of the problems people have when they're squat, okay, is, is the biomechanics of your feet. 
Now, your feet are supposed to sit, let me see if I can get on the camera. They're supposed to sit like this. You're supposed to have an arch in your foot, okay? And this way you could push from your heels and then the other, you know, this is how your, your foot sits on the floor. The problem is, and a lot of guys have no arch in their foot. I'm, I have nothing. I have zero arch. So my foot's like this, okay? Now, even if you have an arch and you put 600 pounds on your back, 500 pounds, 400 pounds, you're squatting, it tends to flatten the arch out anyway with the weight under weight bearings. So number one is I tell people to get custom orthotics. These are inserts that go in your shoe and they kind of hold your foot into a rigid position like that. That will prevent this from occurring and once this occurs, your heel is off the ground. So um, if you're a big guy, if you weigh a lot, if you have weak arches to begin with, even if you have good arches, I believe that every person who weight lifts out there should get a pair of custom orthotics made. You can go to your podiatrist, sometimes chiropractors will make them as well. And if you're cheap, too cheap to have the, the real custom made ones, you can go to Walmart and they have a little machine you stand on there and it kind of tells you which ones to buy for your shoes. Now obviously they're not custom made to you, but they're better than nothing. And you take the insert that comes in the sneaker out and you put that in there and you wear them all day long, whether you're training or you're not training. And what that does is it corrects the biomechanics so that you use the right muscles in your legs. And you'll notice that you won't have as much back pain, you won't get as much knee pain, because your mechanics will be much, uh, I guess you could say, could be perfect. I mean, if you get custom orthotics, you can have perfect biomechanics. I had terrible problems with pulling my back out when I first started squatting. Once I got orthotics into my shoes, it solved my problems. Marcus Mosgard, uh, I just finished a show, went back on cycle for two weeks. I've increased my KCAL, but not much keeping a strict diet. At night, I sweat so much, I have to, he basically doesn't sleep in the same bed as his girlfriend anymore because she doesn't want to wake up in a puddle of sweat. <laughs> what do you think the problem is and what can he do? You know, right after a show, you, you got to remember your, your metabolism kicks on. And so you're eating an, a much more food now. So your body's natural inclination when you add a lot of calories in after an extended diet is to burn those calories up. Okay, so what happens is when your body starts increasing its metabolic rate to, to, to burn these calories, you're going to get hot and sweaty. Uh, a lot of times also, because people are not used to eating big caloric or big, I should say, carbohydrate loads, when you start doing that, you start getting huge insulin spikes. And insulin, you know, what's its job? It drops blood sugar. If it drops it too much, you can get those cold sweats, which are the low blood sugar sweats at night. So you can go from the, just actually being really hot because of your metabolism to actually being like cold hot from having low blood sugar. Um, whatever the case may be, what I had to do, what I would do after a show is I'd really turn the air conditioning way down and put a fan right in front of me while I'm sleeping just to keep me cool. It's not fun when it happens, you know, yeah, yeah. but it is good physique wise. You'll look good. You just, you're just going to feel always hot. Um, I had a very fast metabolism when I was competing and I had that happen all the time. I was always hot. There was never a moment off season, pre -con maybe pre contest I cooled down a little bit because my metabolism slowed down, especially toward the very end when my body was conserving. But off season, I was always sweltering. I always was sweaty. I, that's why I walked around in tank top and shorts for, for the good 20 years of my life. Anyone who knows me will know in the winter in New York, I was always in shorts and, and usually a tank top, maybe a little sweatshirt over it just to get through the cold weather outside. But once I got inside, that came right off. And that comes into territory. You know, that, it's a good thing, but you, know, you have to understand what's causing it. Kels Fernandez, so I'll preface this question with the topic on Iron Debate and basically a general talking point over the last week, week and a half uh, following the Olympia as far as whether somebody watching remotely on social media through pictures and videos can accurately judge a show from the perspective of judges or people who are there. So Kels Fernandez wants to know, what do you think about the idea of implementing point-of-view cameras on the judges' table facing the competitors? Fans watching big shows from home will be able to see the show from a judge's point of view when the camera switches angles every so often. Do you think this will help the fans agree with judging decisions? Do you think it'll help, uh, it will show flaws in judging decisions? Do you think it would eliminate the quote, you need to be there argument? I think it would make it worse. Because you're, you, from a, the, a little you know, GoPro on, on a judge's head is not going to give you a good look at what they're really seeing. It's just not. It's, it's a weird angle. It's, it's, it's not, it'll never be the same as, as actually being there in person. Uh, you can't capture... The best person I can give you an example is, Ronnie, uh, is uh, Dorian Yates. Dorian Yates was so grainy, granity, 
fibery hard on stage. I've never seen a picture, not even a video, that has ever even come close to capturing what he looked like in person. It's impossible. You can't do it. You had to see it in person to really appreciate it. Now, you could look at pictures and say, oh, Dorian looked really good and his proportion was good and he had great separation and, and striations, but you couldn't see the graininess of his conditioning. I don't think that my graininess was ever really captured on. I see pictures of myself I want to throw up. I'm like, I think it looked terrible. You know, aside from the, the black and white pair of banal pictures that he shot, which were specifically shot for camera, for, you know, for the for film, I never really saw myself captured properly, you know, and uh, there was maybe a couple videos floating around out there that I thought was, were better than what I, I've seen out there. So you can't capture that on stage. Phil Heath is, is, is one of these guys that has that grainy, nutty look that in person just looks wacky and you can't capture it on film, you can't capture it on video, and I, I don't think it matters where you put your cameras. You could put a camera right on, right, a, a floating camera an inch from his face and it's not going to change the way it looks. Cameras do something to flatten out the image and if you want to see it, go see the Mr. Olympia, go see the Arnold Classic, get good tickets and then you'll come back and you'll tell me, Dave, you know what, you're right. Let's go to Kyle Gentry for Dave. I'm in peak week. I step on stage Sunday morning. Can you give me advice on how to get through this week mentally? <laughs> well, it, I always loved peak week because at least I got to eat. I was carving up, you know what I mean? Uh, you're really not training very much. You know, you're, you're going to tr not train the last two days. Have fun with it, you know? It's kind of like, you know, you can kind of chill for it. You're not going to be in the gym for three, four hours a day. You're going to be eating foods that you kind of like a little bit more than you were doing before. You got to make it a fun experience for yourself. If it's not fun, then you shouldn't be doing the sport, you know? Um, does it suck because you, 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 know, you, buy, you feel like a machine and you, don't feel, you feel like you, know, you, you, you almost don't even feel like a real human being because you're that lean and you're that tired and you're that run? Of course, but that runs comes to the territory. You have to revel and you have to love that. If you don't love that, then you'll never be a great uh, bodybuilder because that's part of the sport. It comes with it. It, it. You have to accept that. John Emper, is there a correlation between uh, growth hormone and gap teeth. I've noticed many bodybuilders with gap teeth such as Kai Green, Lionel Baecki, Lee Haney, etc. Arnold Schwarzenegger had them too. I, I don't know. I think that might be an indication of, of high natural growth hormone. Uh, I don't, GH usage doesn't cause that, but I think that these guys naturally had that to begin with and that could indicate that there might have been a high natural GH output in these athletes and which means, might mean why they were so genetically predisposed to be good bodybuilders. That's what I think it might mean. Um, obviously, like I said, taking GH doesn't cause the gap tooth. It's, it's kind of just, uh, it just happens to be that a lot of great bodybuilders have it. Let's go to Ian's Lathe. Now that Phil Heath has equaled Arnold's record of seven Olympia wins, should he go one better next year? How does his legacy compare to Lee and Ronnie? Well, you know, everyone keeps saying, um, uh, that Phil Heath tied Arnold Schwarzenegger's seven record of seven Olympias. Well, it's not a record. It was a record. not a record, right? It was a record before Lee Haney broke it, and then Ronnie Coleman tied it. So right now, I mean, Phil has a lot of Olympias. He's the you know this the third most you know tied for the third most winningest bodybuilder of all time on Olympia stage, but he hasn't really established a legacy for himself. If he ties Ronnie and 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 uh, Haney, that will put him in an elite category, of course, but. The thing that will separate him for the rest of the sport will be if he can win number nine, which no one's been able to do yet. Haney didn't try. Ronnie did twice and failed. Or KWD, how to control water retention from DECA with HGA. Um, you know, water retention is really a, a, you know, is a predisposition for water retention. Because you, you can take every drug in the world, and if you don't, take, if you don't eat a lot of carbohydrates, you won't retain water. Uh, but you could take one shot of, uh, you know, DAC or a test a week, and if you eat too many carbs, you'll get bloated because it, it increases your propensity to hold water. Um, the best thing I always recommend for people is, is don't cut your sodium back and don't cut your fluids back um, because that makes you more sensitive to, flu to, to, to fluid retention. Uh, I know it sounds counterintuitive, but it does because what happens is aldosterone levels rise when you take these, these anabolic drugs. Eating sodium and drinking water actually suppresses aldosterone. So... Don't make yourself more sodium sensitive by not eating sodium when you when you get to, into this situation because then you're going to just be a, you're going to be like a time bomb waiting to happen. You have one piece of pizza and you and you gain 15 pounds of water from it. 
Let's go to today. Could be it. Make it count. Uh, does high amounts of trend really show higher E2 levels for a false high as you and the author of anabolic research, Bill Wellen, spoke about in your interview? Um, I, I, I don't really think that Trenbolone raises estrogen that much. I think that what happens is that if you take too much Trenbolone, you get estrogen production. I think a lot of these drugs are dose dependent. If you use ridiculously high amounts, all the rules go out the, the, the window. Because theoretically, Trenbolone doesn't convert to estrogen. Okay, But I, I, it seems like it does in, in very high amounts. Now, it's sometimes hard to distinguish whether you're getting... Uh, you know, gynecomastia sensitivity because of your, your high estrogen levels or if it's because the Trembolone is raising your prolactin levels really high. Now, back in the day, okay, I hate to say that because it makes me sound really old, but it's true. Back in the day, we used to use a drug called Parabolone. Parabolone was, was Trembolone and Anthate. It was long-acting Trembolone, okay? And we would, it, was, it came in ampules, uh, a cc and a half, and the whole ampule was 76 milligrams. And you would take two of those a week, and you'd get great results. You never retain, you wouldn't cause any estrogen release, your estrogen levels were in check, and you didn't get any side effects. And that's where we based the, you know, the science on that, that, that Trembolone doesn't aromatize. But that's because we were taking less than 150 milligrams a day, you know, a, a week. Guys now, they take that per day, seven days a week. And so I think when you start doing like, you know, ridiculously high amounts of Trembolone, you have a much higher uh, propensity to turn or to increase prolactin levels to even convert to estrogen in some degrees and to get these estrogenic and prolactin induced side effects. So once again, if your dosages are moderate and you stay in the recommended you know, values, I don't think you're gonna see that. But I think once you start getting crazy and trying to test the limits of, of how much crap you can pump into your body, you're gonna get side effects. Igor P. Tank, how do you approach rebound after dieting phase with your clients slowly increasing calories to prevent huge water retention and hormone imbalance or quote, blow up for a short period, then back it off? Um, I don't like to really start putting people on diets like right after a show. I kind of let them eat for a couple of days. Um, but in the same light, I try to keep them on a little bit of diuretic for a couple of days so they don't rebound out of control. So let's say you know a person wants to go and I let them eat for two, three days. I'll tell them to take a half a diazide maybe a day. Uh, you know, like on, on if this show's on Saturday, maybe on a Sunday night, Monday night, Tuesday night, I'll give them a half a diazide. I let them drink and eat. And, and take as much sodium as they want in because I want their body to regulate themselves. The diazide is just pushing out that extra ex excess water that the person's holding. And that seems to work well. After about a week, their bodies kind of regulate themselves and then we get them back on a diet. Now, in terms of what to give people, I, you know, to put them back on a contest diet is kind of silly. But I, what I tell them is try to get like maybe, if you're a guy, anywhere from 35 to 45 grams of carbs per meal, maybe the first five meals of the day as opposed to the first six. You know, let's say you're doing six meals. Um, I keep usually on a protein fat type regimen with the extra carbs and that seems to keep them satiated. And then if they want to have a cheat meal in place of one of those meals a couple times a week, that's fine. You just don't want to be eating junk every single meal. Because what happens is you go from eating six times a day to eating three times a day, but you're eating the worst garbage in all, uh, in all of creation. And of course you're going to retain fluid from all those sugars and carbohydrates and salt and stuff like that. So, you know, try to keep a regimented uh, routine of eating just substitute out a couple of meals. If one meal you want to go to McDonald's and instead of having you know steak and, and, and a baked potato, then that's fine. You know, if one meal instead of you having chicken and rice, you want to go and have you know pancakes and eggs, do it. But just don't do it every meal. Let's go to Mackey 1977. Does wearing sweats during cardio benefit in any way besides water loss? I still see a lot of old school bodybuilders that still do this. I've been told that it doesn't help with fat loss at all. No, well, you know, they, ironically enough, sweating burns less calories than shivering does. So, you know, if, if you really want to increase uh, caloric burning, go do your cardio in like in, in a freezer somewhere. Put a, a stationary bike in there and pedal in a freezer just because your body, just to keep itself warm, will expend way more calories than it will from sweating. So it, it's a bad idea. You know, when I would do cardio, I would be almost naked, practically, because I don't want to sweat. I wanted to sweat as little as possible. I'm already suffering. I'm already miserable. I'm starving. Do I want to be sweating to death on top of that, ready to pass out? It's unnecessary. It's unnecessary. It's, uh, it's unnecessary suffering. I know Kai Green loves to be covered up. He's a different character. Most people don't want to be sweating like that all the time. 
Espal95. Dave, any tips for working out rear delts? I'm trying to stay symmetrical and keep my front delts from dominating my rear delt. I like to use, and anyone who's seen me train in the gym, I like to get on that side lateral machine, and I like to put my arm behind the pad, and I like to bring it back this way. Okay, so I'm doing, it's like I'm doing a side lateral, except I'm, I'm, my body's turned so that I'm, I'm targeting that rear delt. I like that because it keeps continuous tension on that rear delt, okay, so that there's, you know, you're getting a nice pump in there, and you're getting a nice contraction. And you're not, you can't really cheat because your elbow is the only thing on the pad. You're not even holding on to anything. You're pushing back from your elbow. Uh, what I find when you, do the, when you do the reverse pec deck, I think you use too much trap in there and people cheat and they pull from their forearms. So once again, I, I like that. Get on that side lateral machine, get your arm behind it and, and pull straight back. I think it'll be the best, the best pump you ever got in your rear delts. G Life, when are you going to get, well, the first question, when are you going to get Milos Sarsev back for an interview the second your thoughts on eaa intro workout eaa mm -hmm. plus carbs intro workout and the biggest difference well let's go with those first two uh, it goes into a third as well well we we interviewed milos at the um at the olympia expo it's a little small little fun interview we'll put that up we're going to get him back for some science type stuff uh where i'll actually debate him i even asked him i said you want to do some debate stuff because i don't agree with everything you say milos and, uh, but I, I do think that we both have a very you know, deep science background. I think people would, would appreciate the different sides of the argument. Um, but I'm not going to take it easy on you, and I'm sure you won't take it easy on me. He's like, oh, I'd love to do it. So we probably will do something in the future together, uh, you know, probably after all these shows are over and it kind of slows down toward the end of the year. That's the best time for we can do a lot of science stuff. Plus, Milos is still working at his paperwork. Once everything's done, uh, he'll be available, I think, to do more uh, TV programming with us. So... That's how we'll handle it, okay? Because um, I, think that, I think it's interesting. Uh, as far as e, uh, essential, fat, essential amino acids go, uh, I think that you can get them from food and whey protein as easily as you can get them from essential amino acid formulas. Um, do I think that the essential amino acid formulas have a place in bodybuilding? Absolutely. I have one coming out. I have a product called Amino Evolved coming out, which is an essential amino acid uh, product. It'll be out probably in the next couple of weeks. And, uh, and I think it does have a place, more so in the off-season, I think than pre-contest, because pre-contest, you have kind of a limit on how much you can eat. I don't think anyone wants to drink an, a, a, an essential amino acid formula in, in lieu of eating a food meal. I think most people would agree a food meal or a whey protein shake is way more uh, appetizing than, than doing essential uh, amino acids. So I think off-season, we're going to see a much greater use for that, and, and, and Milos and I will talk about that. Let's go to Dale David 96. Uh, what do you think of natural bodybuilding? Is it worth the ride? I've been lifting for about four years, and I feel like I've reached my limit. I'm not big at all. Should I consider taking stuff to get bigger, or do you think I can get bigger without? Also, what do you think of the chicken and broccoli only diet to get shredded? <laughs> well, you know, when you eat only chicken and broccoli, you're, you're, you're limiting your essential fatty acids, you're limiting your protein sources, you're limiting, you know, your 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 carbohydrate fuel. So. I don't think eating the same thing of anything the whole day is a smart, you know, thing to do. In terms of natural bodybuilding, you know, whether you want to be natural or you want to take anabolic steroids, that's a personal decision. I can't make that for you. I hit a point in my career as a natural bodybuilder where I just couldn't make any more gains. I think I got up to like 200, maybe 11, 12, 13, 14 pounds, and I, and I really just couldn't grow anymore. And I just made a personal decision. I was going to try to use anabolics, and, 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 that's, and, and I did it. I was 22 years old. So that's going to be a personal decision you make. It depends what your goals are. I wanted to be a competitive bodybuilder. Had I not wanted to be a competitive bodybuilder, I probably never would have taken steroids at all because I, I didn't, it wasn't something like I, I had to be big because it was, I was inadequate in my mind. I liked the whole idea of competing against yourself, against other guys on stage, and I knew that in order to do that, Especially my, given my frame that I had, because I wasn't a short guy, I probably needed to take anabolic steroids. And that's why I, I made the decision to do it. But that's a personal decision that you guys have to make. I can't make that for you. Polish Guns 89. Um, where does he go with this? Uh, your best advice to keep a body healthy and injury-free, knowing that lifestyle is very taxing on the body, would you suggest cupping or acupuncture? Uh, also, any natural vitamins, minerals I should be taking. My RMT suggested turmeric to help lower body inflammation. Any advice would be greatly appreciated. You know, I don't want to go on a diatribe about, you know, my nutrition line of products, species nutrition, but I, you know, I've said it before. Um, there's so many things you can buy out there 
that will help you. But the bottom line is if you're not getting the right, first of all, diet is the most important. Protein, fats, carbs. The, the macros are the, mo- the, the main, the, 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 the three macros are the most important thing you could worry about. Once you got that kind of taken care of, now you have to talk about the micronutrients, okay? Vitamins and minerals. And you got to get minerals that are absorbable. You got to get vitamins in the right potency. And once you put that together, okay, that solves another major problem. The problem is that there, most of the, the essential you know, uh, vitamins and mineral formulas out there are very low dosed. They're underdosed. They don't use absorbable forms of these vitamins or minerals. And you're not really getting anything. You're not going to get enough uh, vitamins and minerals in one pill a day to do anything to your body. So a product like my V Mineralize becomes very valuable and very convenient because it has everything you need in there. You take five pills twice a day. End of story. Um, in addition to that, you know, you definitely want to take extra vitamin D. You want to get 7,000 total units of vitamin D per day. Uh, my V Mineralize has two. You can add, you know, a 5,000 mil, uh, uh, unit or IU uh, pill of vitamin D, which is probably cost you about 10 cents a day. They're really cheap. Um, you can buy them anywhere. Online, you can buy them in CVS Pharmacy. And the third thing you want to do is you want to use a, an essential fatty acid supplement because that will keep your total body inflammation down, especially if you use a product like my Omegalize which has your three grams of fish oil in it, has your 2,600 milligrams of primrose oil, and it has your omega-7 palmitoleic acid, which lowers body inflammation, in- increases insulin sensitivity. That's probably, those two supplements alone are probably the first two things every single person should buy out there, okay? Once you do that, you know, then everything else is icing on the cake. You know, I, I think everyone should take a fiber supplement every day. You don't have to use my Fiberlize if you don't want to, but it's, it, it tastes delicious and it's very convenient, and it has exactly what you need in it. You know, if you want to use a whey protein, you get a whey protein. You want to use a carb drink, you use a carb drink. Um, as far as health goes, you know, c- can you take something for your liver? Sure. If you have liver issues, you might want to take, you know, milk thistle. Um, I sell Bill Llewellyn's product, Liver Stable, on my DavePalumbo.com website. It's a terrific product. I also sell a product called Kidney, kidney Stuff, which is great if you have kidney issues or a high creatinine level. So you got to kind of see what, what you got that's wrong with you and then, and then address it. But to stay healthy, it's the vitamin, minerals, essential fatty acids. Cannot go wrong with that. Take one more question. This one from the Atomic Beast. This, this, this question might usher in another episode of Versus. Here we go. <laughs> if Big Ramy and the Prime, Ronnie Coleman, Ronnie Coleman and his Prime, matched up both equally as shredded, would Ronnie still be bigger than Ramy? In that regard, is Ronnie still the biggest shredded bodybuilder in Olympia history to date? Yeah, Ronnie Coleman is the greatest bodybuilder of all time. Not just the, the, the biggest guy. He's the greatest bodybuilder of all time. Arnold might be the most you know, famous, but Ronnie is the greatest. And that's because of the, not only the, the size he, he packed on his body, but the conditioning he brought to the stage and the detail in his physique. Um, Rami would probably have to be 275, you know, 280 to be in the shape that Ronnie was in at his prime. And Ronnie weighed in almost at, I think he was like 290 at, at that 2003 Olympia. So I don't think Rami is as big as, as, as Ronnie. He might look bigger than Ron, Ronnie because... But in shape, when he's at his prime, peaked out, strided everywhere, his weight will probably be lower than what Ronnie's was. So I don't think he's quite as big as Ronnie, but he, has, he, might, have, he might have better proportion than Ronnie. The thing that made Ronnie so special is, is the detail that his, his arms had, his glutes had. I mean, he was ridiculous. I'm waiting for the day that Ronnie shows up with that level of conditioning because that will be the day that he's Mr. Olympia. That is going to do it for this episode of As Dave, brought to you by Species Nutrition. Again, right now on the website, Testalize is back. For those of you who have been waiting long to order it, it is back in stock, ready to go on speciesnutrition.com. For Dave Palumbo and our producer, Johnny Styles, doing an awesome job as always. I'm Sadiq Faruqi. We'll see you next week.